Great news, a wealthy relative has left you $100 million. You can't access it though until you're 60, but that's, that's pretty good news. I've got some better news for you. Everyone in the place is 25. You're 25, when you reach 60, you'll get the 100 million. But the downside is you've gotta wait 35 years, 35 years to scratch out a living, 35 years until you inherit the big kahuna. But let's just say, because we're talking hypothetically, that the trust was written in such a way that you can access the wealth today. Let's say at 25, you could begin to live off 5% of the interest, which will be about $5 million a year. So you're rich, you're wealthy, $5 million a year. You can make that when you're 25, 26, 27, and then when you're 60, you can inherit the big kahuna. Would that be off the chain or what? I mean, if that happened to be you or if it were me, I would do anything possible to access that kind of money. Wouldn't it be horrible to get to 60 and for a bunch of attorneys to look at you and me and go, hey, you could have accessed that money for 35 years. You could have lived off the interest. You could have made five million a year, but you didn't talk to the right people. You didn't know who you are. You didn't know whose you are, and you didn't really understand what you had, so man, you kind of blew it. Yeah, you're 16, you got the big money now, but man, you could have, it could have been unbelievable for 35 years. That would not be a happy scenario, would it? Well, let's face it. A lot of us are living in spiritual poverty. We don't know who we are, whose we are, or what we have. We don't know the wealth that we have access to. We don't know the kind of currency that's available for us. Our gracious God has so many things in store for us because of who we are, whose we are, and what we have, but many times we rock around and we're clueless regarding what's available to us. We're clueless concerning what God has for us. We're clueless. We're clueless. The Bible is a book of promises. If you understand the promises of God, you can understand virtually every verse of Scripture in the Bible. God has promises for us to claim. Oftentimes I talk to people who are clueless about the promises of God, and many of us are clueless. That's why I'm doing a series called Clueless. Others, though, are clueless because they think they're clued in to the promises of God, but in reality, they're clued in to fantasy land stuff. Like they walk around and say, well, God has promised me health and wealth and a pain-free life. I look at them and go, what are you smoking? <laughs> where, where, where is that in Scripture? It's critical that we understand and know the promises of God. Because if we don't, one day we're gonna get to heaven and inherit the big kahuna, you know, streets of gold, mansions, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm afraid that God will look at many and say, I had all of this for you, all of this real currency for you to tap into, but you didn't know who you were or whose you were or, or, or what you had. You, you, you didn't realize it. I don't want that to happen. That's why we need to understand the promises of God. The Bible is all about the promises of God. The promises of God are foundational. So picture in your mind's eye a stool, and on one leg you've got knowledge, on another leg you've got belief, on another leg you've got action. I'm talking about A-C-T, I-O-N. Do that with me, A-C-T, I-O-N. We can do better than that, A-C-T, I-O-N. Thank you, I, I knew that last one would really get it. When it comes to the promises of God, I've got to know them. Do you know them? Are you clueless or are you clued into them? Most of us are clueless, let's face it. We've got to believe them. Okay, I believe God in your promises. I believe them, I know them, I believe them. Then the third leg is I've got to put shoe leather or shoe rubber beneath them. I've got to, I've got to live them out. I've got to tap into that, I've got to know who I am and, and what's available to me and, and what God has done in my life. Those are huge, huge things for us to understand and for us to know. The promises of God. 
The Bible says this in Hebrews 6 about the promises of God. Hebrews 6, verses 17 and 19. It says, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. Isn't that cool? Because the heirs, that's, that, that's you and me. Verse 18. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. Well, this series over the next several weeks about the promises of God will be encouraging. I mean, you, you, you will be fired up. Verse 19, we have this hope as an what? Anchor, as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Firm and secure. We're looking for an anchor. Our culture is all about empty promises. We make and break promises all the time. Someone walks up to you, you don't know, and they go, hey, can I borrow your iPod? I promise to give it back. You're thinking, this guy's going to probably rip it off. I'm not going to give it to him. Maybe your son or daughter says, hey, Dad, can I borrow your iPod? I promise to give it back. You definitely don't let them borrow it because you'll never see it again. Maybe, though, your spouse asks you, can I borrow the iPod, honey? Yes, your spouse. I mean, hopefully you trust your spouse. Your spouse's word is good. You can count on your spouse's promise. Well, when God makes a promise, he boldly backs it up. When God says things, he does things. We serve a God who does what he says and says what he does. God wants the promises to be operative in our life. He wants us to walk in his currency. He wants us to stand secure on his promises. Come hell or high water, we can stand on the promises of God. Broke, busted, and disgusted, we can stand on the promises of God. When rogue winds hit, we can stand on the promises of God. When your best friend disses you, you can stand on the promises of God. When someone walks out the door, you can stand on the promises of God. When you get the phone call, you can stand on the promises of God. The promises of God. What is a promise? A promise is simply a declaration assuring that a person will or will not do something. We live in a culture of the empty promise. People just kind of cruising through, floating around. Talk is cheap. My parents got me a John boat. When I was a kid, a little green aluminum boat, the cheap thing, it gave me one paddle. We lived off of a dirt road, and I took the boat across the dirt road to a lake, and I would paddle this boat in the high winds because this lake was windy, I'm telling you. One day I thought, you know what, I'm going to make an anchor. I'm tired of paddling. I'm going to make an anchor, something secure, something heavy. So I got some clothesline. Who knows where I got it? A Clorox bottle put the Clorox bottle in a sandbox and dumped all the sand in there, put the top on it, tied that to the clothesline, took it to the lake, paddled out. Oh, this is a good spot. Threw the anchor overboard. I made a dumb decision. I forgot how deep the lake was. This lake was like 18 feet, you know, 20 feet. And the clothesline was only like 10 feet. And then the, the Clorox bottle was so light, the sand didn't give it the weight it should have had. And it got all muddy and stuff, and it was kind of floating, and I was blown all over the lake. It was terrible. So many people I run into all the time are, are looking for things that are secure and firm, yet you're using anchors made of clotheslines and Clorox bottle. Oh, man, if I sleep in this bed with this person, that'll be it. If I make this deal, that'll be it. If I move to the corner office, that'll be it. If I have this high, that'll be it. If I get to that position, this'll be it. If I go to that college, that'll be it. And you're being blown around the lake of life. No security, nothing solid, nothing secure. Well, God comes along and God says, throw your anchor overboard. Put it on my word, in my promises. Know them, understand and believe them, and live them out. Well, today, I'm going to talk about a promise that is the foundation for all promises. All the other promises emerge from this promise. When I tell you the promise, you're going to say, Ed, I have heard that a squillion times. 
I can't believe you're even insulting me with those words. You're telling me that's a promise of God? Come on, let's get, let's get something maybe, maybe deeper, something more profound. Well, I'm going to tell you something. This promise... I said, this promise is so deep that most of you won't understand what we're even talking about. But you will one day once you begin to walk in the fullness of this promise. And the reason I'm sharing this promise with you is for you to discover the depth that God wants for every single life here. Because remember, the promises are for our best, our best life now. It's for us to walk in fullness. So, drum roll please. Hold on to your theater seats. Here's the promise that we need to understand, the key and critical promise. God loves me. That's the promise. Let's say it again. Here's the promise. Drum roll please. God loves me. Say it with me. God loves me. I'm talking about, in Scripture, the unconditional, irrational, one-of-a-kind love of God. You see, I have a hard time getting my mind around that promise because it is so deep and rich. Why do you say that? Well, I say that because our world is all about conditional love. You keep the terms, you do this, you do that, then I'll do this, and I'll do that, and I'll keep the terms, and we'll come together, and you know, we can love each other and all that. But God says, I love you unconditionally, irrationally, with a one-of-a-kind love. There is nothing that I can do. There is nothing that you can do to cause God to love you any more or any less. Nothing. That freaks me out. That blows my mind if I think about it. You mean nothing? God's going to love me unconditionally, irrationally, with a one-of-a-kind love. There is nothing I can do right now to cause God to love me any more or any less. That's what Scripture says. Woo! Man, man. Now some of you are going, oh, oh, this is a great message. God loves me unconditionally. There's nothing I can do to cause God to love me any more or any less. I guess now I can go buck wild. I can just do whatever I want to do, man. This is, I love fellowship church, and I love you. Thank you for sharing that with me. I will go out and go crazy, man. Ah, no, 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 no. No, no, no. God loves us unconditionally, irrationally. There's nothing we can do to cause God to love us any more or any less. That's a fact. We can count on it, a promise of God. However, for us to access the fullness of the unconditional love, there are some conditions that we must meet. What's the key to the Christian life? What's the key to discovering the irrational, unconditional love of Jesus? I'll tell you what the key is. It's one word. Obedience. That's it. Trust and obey. There's no other way. Obedience. That is the key that unlocks the door to this deep, unconditional, irrational love. Here's what's so interesting. A lot of people are experiencing the unconditional love of God, but they don't even know it. They're like, whoa, yeah, but they don't even know it. They don't even know it. Well, how can you say that? Well, I'll tell you how I can say that because I know people who are far away from God, they're clueless about God and the fact that God loves them, but their heart is beating, they're breathing, they have a roof over their head, food on the table, clothes on their back. Where did it come from? Well, they're pretty creative. They, they have a good business mind. Well, who gave them that mind? Who gave them the body? Who gave them the ability for their heart to beat and for them to take in breath? God did. So they're experiencing the unconditional love of God just by existing. That's how much God loves us. Now, others of us have been ambushed by God's love. We've responded to God's love, and we're like, wow, Lord, thank you. I love you, and I see how much you love me, and I want to return that love to you. I want to demonstrate that love to you. A lot of people are that way. Well, Scripture says that God's love is eternal. Jeremiah 31.3, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. Again, I'll throw this out at you. The one who knows me the best loves me the most. Think about it. With skeletons in our closet, with the moral turnovers we've made, with the sin, with the junk and the funk, the God of the universe 
loves me with an everlasting love. He knows me the best and knows you the best, loves you the most. That, again, that, just, that just messes me up. Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God loves me just the way I am. There's nothing I can do to cause God to love me any more or any less. God loves me unconditionally, but for me to tap into his awesome love, there's some conditions that I've got to meet. God loves me just the way I am, but he loves me too much to allow me to remain in the state that I am. I hope you didn't miss that. John 14, 15, here's what Jesus said. He said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. I've known Lisa for over 30 years, and I'll never forget the first time I told her that I loved her. Guys, how many of you are married? Lift your hand. Okay, do you remember the first time you told her that you loved her? <laughs> we were sitting in a porch swing on Lisa's back porch, and I was, I was you know, working up enough nerve to, to make this high-risk pronouncement, you know what I'm saying? And I said, Lisa, I like spending time with you. I'm just going to wait to see if she, you know, gave it back. She goes, well, I like spending time with you too. Uh, I really love hanging out with you. And she said, well, I, I love hanging out with you too. And, and then I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. I said, Lisa, I love you. And it seemed like hours. Guys, the women love to make us sweat and wait, don't they? She's like looking at me. I'm thinking, okay, what will she do? I mean, it's a high-risk pronouncement. Will she, will she reject my love? Will she spurn my love? Will she say, uh, no, I don't feel the same way. I mean, I, I put the cards on the table. I love you, Lisa. And like two hours later, it seemed like she looked back and she said, I love you too. Well, now we didn't just say it, we demonstrated it. <laughs> so we've said it a squillion times. We also demonstrate it. We boldly back it up. God says he loves you and loves me, but he boldly backs it up. Let's think about it. God has said, I love you, and all heaven is waiting for your response. He's brought you to this point, maybe to this service, to hear this. God says, I love you. He's boldly backed it up. He's waiting for your response. What's your response? Are you going to hydroplane over it? Are you going to reject it? Are you going to do the stiff arm and push back? Or are you going to say, I love you too? And are you going to demonstrate your love? Because again, what's the key to walking in the fullness of the unconditional love of Jesus? Obedience. Obedience. And I'm not talking about a legalistic trip, I'm talking about a love relationship. We live a life of purity, a life of holiness before God, not out of our own strength and power, but because of His grace and mercy. We live it because we love Him. We want to access the best for our lives, and the best is when we walk in sync with the Lord, when we walk in concert with him, when we walk in this unconditional, unfathomable, one-of-a-kind love. When you do that, we'll find ourselves doing things that, that, that are just totally supernatural. We'll feel the supernatural octane in our lives that the world just, just doesn't have. What did Jesus say in John chapter 10, verse 10? He said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Maybe in your translation it says to the full. The word abundance in the Greek is pronounced parasos. 
Parasos is a cool word. Look behind the word. The word is the picture of someone with, with a glass and another someone pouring liquid in the other someone's glass. And instead of that someone going, whoa, that's enough, big fella, the pitcher keeps pouring and pouring and pouring, spilling over the brim, spilling on your hand, spilling on the table, spilling in the kitchen. You say you love Jesus? You say it? Well, are you obeying it? Are you obeying him? Are you following him? Because if we are, we're spilling love onto everyone. I should be spilling love onto Lisa, spilling love onto my kids, spilling love to people I come in contact with around the community, spilling love to people when I travel. I'm always spilling love, this unconditional, one-of-a-kind, supernatural love. I spent several days in Hawaii with my family because we were celebrating my father's 70th birthday. And there was a guy staying in a condo beneath my parents, and he had some kids with him. And I found myself talking to him one day, and I discovered he was from the Northwest. And I'm thinking to myself, why am I even talking to him? This guy can't do anything for me. I mean, what, why, why, why am I wanting to hear about his story? I'm thinking, I'm on my vacation. Well, why am I doing this? And I began to feel this, this uh, connectivity with him as he told me about his, his family and his life. And, 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 and then I began to say to myself, I know why. God has hooked us up together. This guy is far away from God. He does not know Christ, and I have this love for him that's not love for me, because in the natural, who gives a flying flip about him? But because I'm walking in this supernatural, one-of-a-kind, irrational love, I had this desire to talk to him, to see what was going on in his life. And after we talked for a while, we exchanged phone numbers and emails, and then I discovered, amazingly, in March, I will be in his city doing some speaking, and we're going to hook up there, and, and, and nothing just happens. Well, since nothing just happens, and we have this irrational, unconditional, one-of-a-kind love going and flowing in our lives, that should spill over in everything we're about. Here's a test that I do with, with myself because I always ask myself, Ed, are you walking in this love? Are you walking in the fullness? Are you obeying? I say, Ed, are you serving somebody? Are you sharing with someone? And are you giving something? Those are three little things I ask myself. Am I serving somebody? What did Jesus say? If you want to become great, serve. Serve. People ask me all the time, well, how do you get all these people, Fellowship Church, involved in volunteering? Do you like pay them, twist their arm? Again, I'll tell you, I try to convince people based on Scripture that they're madly loved by the God of the universe. And when people understand that and they're ambushed by that, they cannot wait to express their love back to God in serving Him. They cannot wait to demonstrate it in the context of the local church. I've got to ask you, are you serving? How about sharing? Are you sharing? I ask myself that. Am I sharing the love? I have a story to share, and I love to share. But it's also nerve-wracking to share because sometimes I don't know all the answers to the questions people ask me. And one of the best answers you can give is this. I don't know, but I'll find out. You know, I'll go to the source, or I'll go on the World Wide Web, or I'll call someone who's smarter than me, and that's not very difficult to do, and I will get most of the answers. Sharing. Are you giving something, something that that matters, something that means something to you, like money, <laughs> like stuff you like. As I told you a couple of months ago, Lisa and I are in the process of giving by far the largest gift we've ever given to Fellowship Church in the history of our lives. Now, if an accountant saw that, it'd probably give him or her palpitations. But you know what? I don't go to the accountant before I give. I go to God. He's the ultimate accountant. And speaking of these things, are you serving somebody? Are you sharing with someone? Are you giving something? Speaking of these things, I hope you, hope you see where I'm tracking. Because see, risk 
and love are linked together. All these people walking around, man. Extreme sports, extreme sports, man. Snowboarding, hang gliding, riding the giants like Laird Hamilton. Man, I'm into extreme stuff, man. Skateboarding, adrenaline, that buzz, that rush, man. It's me. Now, that's cool. I think it's great to be into sports like that. That's awesome. Why do we have this desire for adventure and risk and adrenaline? I know why. It's given to us by God. You ever thought about that? It's a God thing. God's a God of risk. <laughs> You're talking about risky. Yeah, God's sovereign, but sending Jesus Christ to planet Earth to die for sinful people like you and me. You're talking about rolling the dice. It's incredible. So yeah, if you're an extreme sports guy or girl, good for you, but I believe that desire you have is a microcosm of a bigger desire that can only be fulfilled when you're walking in the fullness of God's unconditional love. So here's what I'm saying. When was the last time you risked something spiritually that was so big, that was so massive, God had to show up to get you through it? When was the last time? that you did that. You got to serve somebody in a risk-taking way. You got to share with someone in a risk-taking way. You got to give something in a risk-taking way on the edge and the ledge, on the ragged edge of adrenaline and adventure. There's nothing like it. That is the way the Christian life is supposed to be lived. And it's, it's time for us to take risk as believers. And that's what I love about Fellowship Church, man. We're a risk-taking church. And here's what's so cool about taking risk. You ready for this? When you take a risk, what does it matter if it messes up or if you fail? If we're in Christ, if we're walking in the fullness of Jesus, we can fall flat on our face. We can embarrass ourselves, but at the end of the day, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. At the end of the day, I'm irrationally and unconditionally loved by God. So as a believer, I should be the biggest risk taker out there. Because again, you're talking about a safety net. You're talking about confidence and security and a healthy self-esteem. Jesus is smiling at you and me and saying, I love you. You matter to me. You're awesome. So we should be able to do all this stuff. That's why at Fellowship Church, we've taken a bunch of risks. It was a risk to start and to build a campus in downtown Dallas. It's a risk to do one in Plano, a risk to do one in Alliance. It's a real risk to go to South Florida and do Fellowship Church in Miami. But it's fun. I love it. It's a risk. What if it doesn't work? Well, who cares? Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And at Fellowship Church, at Fellowship Church, we... We have tried to create this environment because it's an environment as we walk in love where we do take risk, and, that, and that's the Christian life. Read the Gospels. Look at Jesus. She's talking about taking risk. Look at the disciples. Look at the early church followers. So Christianity should not be this thing that's stifling, this thing that, that is limiting. It's, it's a thing of freedom and liberation. We're made for this irrational, one-of-a-kind love, and we can never walk in the fullness until we trust and obey, until we say, God, I love you, and I want to demonstrate my love to you. First John 4, 19, we love because He first loved us. I'm not loved because I'm valuable, but I'm valuable because I'm loved by the God of the universe. And once I discover that, and once I say, God, I love you back and begin to walk in that, that's when the lights come on. That's when I discover my best life, and you'll discover your best life as well. Some of you have made this decision to connect with Jesus Christ, and that's great. Serve somebody. Share with someone and give something. Take the risk. Take the risk. Yeah, you can still participate in extreme sports, but do the real extreme stuff. Others of you, maybe you've never made a decision to say, I love you to Jesus. You know, Jesus said, 
And he says, I love you. He's brought you here because of his irrational, one-of-a-kind love. He's tried to communicate his love to you time and time again. He's using this service, the songs, video, my voice box, and vocal cords right now to say to you, I love you. You've never locked eyes with someone who does not matter to God. But so often, we like to carry around this little list, this unpublished list of people that we think that don't matter to God. You know what I'm saying to you? Like, oh, she's, she's not really loved by God. He's not really loved by God, only that's not true. We've never seen anyone who's not loved by God. You're loved by God. God loves you. He's crazy about you. And he's waiting to hear your response. Some of you are saying, well, Ed, you know, this is cool, but someday, you know, someday I might say I love you back to God. Someday. Well, the Bible says there is going to be a someday. It's called the day of reckoning. And a lot of people will lock eyes with Jesus that day, and Jesus will say, I sought you. I went after you. I loved you. Despite all of your stumblings and fumblings, all of your failures, all of your sin. But at every interchange, you kept your distance from me. At every interchange, you didn't honor me. You hydroplaned over my love. You didn't treasure my love. You trampled it. At this point, people say, well, Ed, how can a loving God send someone to hell? And I always say this, God doesn't. We make that choice. And Jesus will say to many, you had it your way on earth, and you're going to have it your way in a Christless eternity. So I plead with you, don't put it off. Respond to the love of God. Just say, God, I honor it. I receive Jesus Christ into my life. I want to treasure your love to walk in the fullness and obedience that you have in store for me. Don't remain clueless. Get clued in. Into the radical, supernatural, one-of-a-kind love of Jesus. Okay? Let's pray together. God, you're so awesome and you're so loving and, and I, I thank you. For, for your compassion and your, and your love. Even though I have a hard time getting my brain around it in my finiteness, I know that you love me with an everlasting love, and I thank you for that. And I thank you for the opportunity that I had years ago to, to say I love you back. And I pray that many today would say that. Maybe you're here and you're saying someday, someday we'll... Someday is today. Just say this with me. I can't make you do it. You've got to do it yourself. Just say, Jesus, I love you back. Because God loved you so much, you sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. So God said it, and he boldly backed it up. And now you have an opportunity to say, I love you too. So just say, Jesus, I love you. I ask you, just say that to come into my life, to ambush me. Forgive me, cleanse me. I turn from my sin and turn to you. If you said that, that's the greatest thing you'll ever do. Maybe others here have been throwing anchors over the side of your vessel, anchors made of clotheslines and Clorox bottles, and you find yourself floating. Maybe years ago you made a commitment to Christ. You told him that you loved him, but you've been trying to use God-given gifts and abilities and desires in a God-forbidden way. It's time to, to throw the real anchor overboard as you anchor your life into the love of the Lord. Others of us here need to take a risk to spill love out on others, to serve somebody and to share with someone and to give something Father, I want us to serve and share and give, not to sit and to soak and to hoard. Lord, you're so good to us. May we walk in the fullness of your love. I thank you for a house like fellowship. It's all about your love. I thank you for your unconditional love. In Jesus' name.